those of people who haven't read uh, both your books, I want to spend the first maybe half of the time or so covering books. I think that's a, a relevant book for all of us here, thinking about design and thinking about product in particular, uh, to share some of the highlights from the book. And then after that, we'll talk a little about indestructible and in particular, uh, I know it's focused a lot on what individuals can do. Uh, we also work a lot in teams, so I'm wondering if there are lessons that we can learn from Indestructible about how we organize ourselves and how we work in teams. Thank you for having me. Um, what, I, uh, what I do is uh, I'm a behavioral designer, so I help companies and individuals build good uh, habits as well as break bad habits. So uh, the context that I work in sounds like we're... Mic's good? Okay, they can hear me? All right, terrific. Um, so the context that I work in, I work with companies to build habit-forming products, and I tend to work in uh, healthcare and ed education technology companies, um, uh, 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 financial services companies, any product that requires repeat engagement. That's really my specialty. Uh, I taught for many years at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and then later at the Hassel Platner Institute of Design. And today I do consulting on my own, I do speaking, uh, and I, I'm working on my next book. So that's, that's kind of what my life looks like these days. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would say I kind of 50-50 split my time between helping companies build habits for good and helping individuals, the subject of my second book, Indistractables, about how we break these bad habits. Uh, so Hooked, just to kind of give you the, the 30,000 foot overview, uh, Hooked is about how can we help people do the kind of things they themselves want to do but for lack of good product design, don't do. Particularly in a habitual way. So not one-time behaviors, but the kind of behaviors that people need to do again and again and again to, uh, to achieve their goals. So a few examples, um, uh, Kahoot, for example, is the world's largest ed tech company, and it helps get kids hooked onto learning. Uh, companies like Fitbot uh, help people get hooked to exercise. Uh, financial services products that get people hooked to saving money. Uh, anything that requires repeat engagement. So not about really one-time behavior, it's about products that tend to engage people within a week's time or less. That's pretty much the cutoff point where you can form a habit. If a behavior does not occur within a week's time or less, it's almost impossible to change a consumer habit. And there, are, there are exceptions to the rule, but that's generally the premise. So the way we do this is that we design hooks into the product. What is a hook? A hook is an experience designed to connect a user's problem with your product with enough frequency to form a habit. And these hooks have four parts, four phases. It starts with a trigger. There are two kinds of triggers. We have what's called an external trigger, you'll be very familiar with. External triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that tells us what to do next. The other type of trigger is called the internal trigger, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. The next step of the hook model is the action phase. The action is where the behaviors manifest. So open the app, scroll the feed, push a play button. That is where the behavior itself, the, the definition of a habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. So that second step is where the habit is manifested. The third step, and perhaps the engine of the hook model, is called the variable reward phase. The variable reward phase is where the user gets what they came for, but there's some bit of mystery, some bit of uncertainty, that prompts them to come back again next time. What does this look like? And where does this come from? This comes from the classic work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. He did these very famous experiments in the 1950s, he took a pigeon, he put them in a, a box, which today we call a Skinner box, and he gave these pigeons the opportunity to peck at the disc in order to get a reward. Okay, so peck at the disc, get a reward. This is called operant conditioning. We've all seen this if you have a, a puppy at home, you, you trained your puppy this way, and your kids, if you have kids at home, you probably train them this way. Do an action, get a reward. Operant condition, no big deal. But then Skinner noticed something unusual that one day he didn't have enough of these food pellets, so he couldn't afford to give it to the pigeons every time they pecked the disc, he could only afford to give it to them once in a while. So sometimes the pigeon would peck the disc, no reward, no food pellet. The next time the pigeon would peck the disc, they would get a treat. And what Skinner observed was the rate of response, the number of times this pigeon pecked at the disc, increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Because variability, uncertainty, sparks this wanting, craving reflex, and causes us to engage, it causes us to focus, and it is highly habit-forming. So in all sorts of activities that capture our attention, you're gonna find a variable reward. Uh, when you ask ourselves, why do people watch uh, games on TV? You know, Why do we watch basketball games, or football games, or rugby matches? Why are people obsessed with spectator sports? It's just about this ball you know, bouncing around a pitch or a court. It's variability, we're not sure where it's gonna go. 
Why do people love to gamble? <laughs> right? What is it about gambling? It's uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if you think about what makes for a great television show, a great book, a great video game, it's all about uncertainty. Social media, wonderful example. That's scrolling, never sure what you're going to see, what do people say, what do the comments say, how many likes does something get, high degree of variability. So that's really the engine of the hook model. And then finally, the last step, and probably the most overlooked of the four steps of the hook model, is what we call the investment phase. The investment phase is where the user puts something into the product to make it better with use. And this is a really big deal, because this has never happened before on the scale that we see it happening today. It used to be that in the history of product design, you would make a product, and then you would wait for people to buy it or not buy it, and then you knew if it was successful. Right? So Henry Ford is credited with saying that you could have any color of Model T as long as it was black. Why did he say that? Because it was very hard for him to retool his workshop and make you a blue car, you a red car, you a yellow car. That was really hard to do back then. Well, today, for the first time, companies can make products tailored to individual users. So market size of one. How? Because you are designing the product for yourself based on this principle of stored value. Every time you invest data, content, reputation, skill, uh, followers, when you use the products, you are making it better and better with use. And that is a hallmark of habit-forming products. Unlike th things in the physical world, your clothing, this furniture, or your car, they depreciate, right? Things in the physical world lose value with wear and tear. Habit-forming products do the opposite. They appreciate. They get better and better the more they use because they store value. So it's through successive cycles, through these hooks, trigger, action, reward, investment, this is how behaviors are changed, how our preferences are shaped, and how these habits take hold by forming an association with that other type of trigger that I told you about earlier, the internal trigger. Okay? Studies find that external triggers, the pings, the dings, the rings, everything in our outside environment only account for about 10% of the reason we take an action, 10%. So 10% of the time you check your phone, okay, 15 out of the 150 times per day on average we check these phones, do we check them because of a ping, ding, or ring? The other 90% of the time that we check our phones is because of an internal trigger. What is an internal trigger? An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape from. Boredom, loneliness, anxiety, uncertainty, stress, this is 90% of the time we check our devices. So the goal of a habit-forming product, particularly in the tech space, is to form an association with those internal triggers. We don't create them, they're already there. We form an association with those internal triggers by starting with the external triggers, telling people, hey, come back to the app, notification, email, whatever. By successive cycles through the hook, we don't need those anymore. So when you think about how people check Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp or Slack or Snapchat, how do they check these things? It's not just when they get a ping, ding, or ring. It's when they feel something, right? They do it with little or no conscious thought. That's when the habit is formed. When we don't need to send people scammy messaging and expensive marketing, they do it on their own. That's when we know a habit is formed. So that's the 30,000 foot view of the hook model. We can also talk about how to break those bad habits so that they, we make sure that they serve us as opposed to we serve them. That's the subject of the second book we can get into as well. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Daniel. I want to start by making some of these things that you talk about tangible. You know, before this conversation, I asked you to have a look at some of the local products uh, in Singapore, and how would you rate them in terms of the four hooks? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the tech scene here is one of the reasons I love being in Singapore. I think it's, it feels to me like the same vibe, the same energy uh, that I felt when I moved to Silicon Valley back in 2006. You know, the region in general, and I think, you know, uh, Singapore is the, is the Silicon Valley of Asia, of uh, Southeast Asia. And so uh, there is that same vibe. And we see companies getting started here that really do have, I think, some, some great tenets of the hook model. Uh, you sent me a, a few examples, and I think, you know, for example, Grab is, is a great example. You know, many times I'm, I'm, I, I need a ride, there'll be a taxi there. I don't take the taxi because I'm habituated to, to using Grab. Uh, and there's something, you know, you can, you can kind of plot out the hook model for a product like Grab. Um, I think uh, I, uh, Lazada or Amazon, you know, I think also has a great potential of being happy for me. I think in the future, uh, and I'm not the first person to say this, I think in the future e-commerce companies like Amazon, like the Lazada, will actually get so good because of that investment phase of the hook. They'll have so much information about your preferences and tastes 
that you won't have to actually order products from them to get what you want. They will literally in the future know you so well, they'll just send you a box and say, here's what we think you will need, what you will want, whatever you don't want, send back. Because they'll get so good at knowing your preferences based on that investment phase of the hook, right? Um, so I think that's where that, that's going uh, in the future. Uh, and, and I think, you know, government services in general, uh, look, there's always room for improvement, but uh, you, you know, Singapore is, is light years ahead of, <laughs> of what, I, what I've seen in my home country of the States. Uh, I mean, just the fact that when you use SyncPass, so much less friction, right? So much less effort, so much less cognitive load to figure out, you know, how to log in, for example. I mean, this is, this is whoever, whoever is in the room that helped work on that product, you're, you're, you're a genius <laughs> for, you know, for how easy it is to log into things. Um, I think where, where there's room for improvement is looking for where are the friction points, right? What's the discrete behavior we want the user to do? And then asking ourselves, what's in the user's way? And there's what we call these six elements of friction. So they're time, money, physical effort, cognitive load, non-routine, and social deviance. These friction points that prevent people from doing the thing we've designed for them to do. Um, so so uh, one of the things that we see that's kind of characteristic of, of Southeast Asia as opposed to how we build things in Silicon Valley is that we tend to put a lot of things on the page here, right? And we expect the user to figure it out, right? We say, here's all the things our product can do, you figure it out. And what tends to happen is that people don't actually give us the time and attention. They say, I'll do it later. And they never come back. So I think that's what I see in, in, in many products in the region, not just you know, government products, of course, but uh, in, in general. You know, in your book, you talk about how products should be painkillers rather than vitamins. Uh, right, and that's an idea to, to keep people coming back. Uh, in government, though, I feel like we want to serve our citizens, and I don't think we want them really hooked per se and, and keep coming back. You know, to use a phone analogy, I don't want them actually coming back 90% of the time just because they feel an emotion. How should we think about building products that are going to be relevant and top of mind for people when they need it, but not necessarily cause them to have this situation where they're just coming in? So behaviors don't exist in a vacuum. So it's not like we're creating a new behavior, a new habit, I would argue. The behaviors already exist, right? So what we want to do is to bring people to a new interface that serves their interests as well as our interests better. So the existing habit is what? The phone, right? Where's the phone number? I'll just get someone on the phone, I'll talk to them. The existing habit is I'll go to the community center and I'll find somebody to help me and I'll stand in line for half a day. Or the existing habit is, which is the worst case scenario, I won't do it at all. Right? That's what we're fighting against. We're not, no, I promise you, nobody is at risk of getting addicted to sync pass. <laughs> nobody. Right? That is not our problem. So we don't have to worry about getting people uh, you know, overly dependent on these products because they will go somewhere for these services or to their own detriment. They will figure out, you know, that, you know when you look at all the offerings uh, around what you can do with, with government products. They, they won't get the health services they need. They won't plan properly for retirement. They won't uh, apply for the baby grants, whatever the case might be. They're not going to get those services or they're doing it in a way that's costly for them in terms of time or us in terms of manpower. So the idea is to take those existing habits and move them over to a better interface. But to do that, we have to build that new habit. Cool, I, I want to open it up to, to the audience. So please prepare your, your questions here. If you're online, there's a pigeonhole. So please put in your questions and, and I'd love to ask you know, that. I just have one other question uh, for you about hope, which is around design. Because good design really enables some of the, the actual hooks to happen. What are your thoughts around how we can design products much better. Yeah, so I think the biggest mistake that I see is that uh, product teams don't consider the psychological needs of the, of the user. They think only about the functional needs, right? When they ask themselves, why would someone use this product? Oh, they want to enter their information. They want to get this benefit. They want to get this service. But they don't think about the why. And so there's a technique that uh, it, it came from the Toyota production system, which was called the five whys technique. And to get to the root cause of why something happens, you need to ask why five times. So why, 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 why? And what you'll get to eventually is that feeling. And when you, when you get to the, that feeling, that's where you have the widest aperture. So if you just stop at why would someone do this? Well, they want to do X, Y, Z. It's a very service level analysis. Whereas if you dig deeper, if you go deeper into the, what the emotion, what the psychological itch that they seek to scratch with our product, 
that's where you have the widest aperture and you're likely to come up with the best possible solutions. Because you know, in order to understand, you go, I'll wait for this. <laughs> I can see everybody looking up. <laughs> How are we doing? They, they just loading it in all. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. To ask questions. Yeah. So we should talk about distraction at some point <laughs> around around your home screen. There's a chapter in my book where I talk about that. <laughs> um, so uh, what I lost my train of thought there. What were we talking about? Uh, why? Right. About the psychological why. So when we start with that internal trigger, we're more likely to come up with a solution to actually scratch that user's itch, right? to actually give them what they came for. And we'll oftentimes consider solutions we never considered before if we just stick with the technology answer, which is how most companies do things. Most companies do things by saying, we have the solution, where's the problem? Which is exactly the opposite. You need to start with the problem and then come up with the best possible solution. And the only way to do that is to start with the itch, to start with the psychological need boredom, loneliness, fatigue, insecurity, uncertainty, uh, fearfulness, stress, anxiety. You have to start with the itch, then figure out how you're going to scratch that consumer itch. Give me an example of, of that that really well. Sure. Uh, give me, is there any product that someone finds themselves hooked to that they use every day that maybe we can analyze? Yeah. The what? The mobile phone? Yeah, but what, what, certainly the, the phone is like the macro habit. Is there a particular app on the phone? TikTok. Okay, great example. Yeah, TikTok's kind of. Uh, by the way, TikTok is one of the few products that I had to delete from my phone. It's too. It's too good. It's too good. Not that I'm anti-tech. Obviously, I love these products, but I found that it, for me personally, I'm not. I'm not saying everybody should do this. If you have to, you know, spend the time you what you want to spend your time. But for me, I found that it, it was so engaging. It was so habit forming that I found myself 20, 30, 40 minutes later saying, "What the heck was I just doing?" And that's not how I want to spend my time. So let's analyze TikTok's hook. And by the way, the hook model applies. This is a consumer web example. But the same exact steps apply for enterprise, for government services, for uh, offline, online, it doesn't matter, as long as the behavior occurs with sufficient frequency. OK, that's the criteria. If the behavior is a one-time behavior, you don't need the hook. There's some other things you can do to improve the likelihood or increase the likelihood of the behavior occurring, but you don't need the full hook model. It's a one-time behavior. But anything that you want people to do repeatedly, you can use the hook model. So let's take TikTok, for example. The primary internal trigger for TikTok is what? It's boredom, right? The old habit was turn on the TV. In my generation, before we had phones and the internet, uh, before we had cell phones and the internet, it was turn on the TV, right? You come home from school, you come home from work, you're bored, what do I do? And eh, I'll turn on the TV. The action is to open the app, okay? That's all you gotta do, just open the app, and the app is so well designed that they instantly show you something they think you're going to like. How do they know that? From the very first time you use it, they start collecting information about you and aggregating that information across all their users. And so even the very first time you use the app, you're likely to see something you're going to like. Now, what's the variable reward? The variable reward is the content of the video itself. right? It's always something surprising. It's something funny. It's somebody having a fall. It's somebody, you know, something interesting, a, a cool dance. It's something that's surprising in some way. It's just like a slot machine. Just like a slot machine. And that same mechanic of pulling on a slot machine on TikTok, it's the swipe. Is it the swipe? Yeah, up and down, right? Uh, it's been a while since I've used it. Uh, so that's, you know, if this gets replaced with this, the variable reward of interesting content. Now, the most important part and where TikTok has really mastered the process is the investment phase. Because they are collecting so much information about how you use. Right? Not only is it actively collective investment in terms of uh, whether you like something or upload something or submit something or comment on something, whatever it might be, anything you do actively, it's also passively collective. So just by the very fact that they're tracking how many milliseconds you watch video A versus video B is feeding their algorithm to make the product better the next time. So the next time you go back to the product, they're not going to, if they say, uh, you know, you didn't, very, you didn't watch very much Time, you didn't spend very much time watching the sports clip, but you spent a lot of time watching that, that dance clip. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to send you more dance clips. And so you're storing value in the product. You're making it better and better every time you use it so that over time, it appreciates in value. You're more likely to keep coming back. So that's, that would be an example of, of that. That's, a, that's an easy one.
This methodology is not for designing addictive products. The name of the book, All My Work, is not about how to build addictive products. It's about how to build habit-forming products. So addictions and habits are very different. An addiction is a persistent compulsive dependency on a behavior or substance that harms the user. Harm is implicit in the definition of addiction. Okay, so when someone says, I'm addicted to running or uh, you know, I'm addicted to whatever, unless it's causing you harm, you're not actually addicted. It's got to be compulsive, it's got to be a dependency, and harmful. We never want to design addictive products, at least not by intent. Now, the unfortunate consequence of designing a product that people like, that is engaging, and used by millions, if not billions of people, is that somebody's going to get addicted. Right? If you build a product like TikTok or Facebook or Instagram that's used by billions of people, a small percentage, the studies find about 1% to 3% of the population, is going to get addicted. Because people get addicted to all sorts of stuff. Right? Uh, how many people have a glass of wine with dinner, but we're not all alcoholics? Alcohol is way more addictive than anything on your phone. It, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And yet, the vast majority of people who drink alcohol are not addicted. Some people are addicted, but not everyone. So we never want to intentionally take people. Sometimes it's an unfortunate byproduct, a product that's used by so many people, some people overuse. What we want to do is not build addictive products, we want to build habit-forming products. Habits, we have good habits as well as bad habits, we want to build those good habits, defined by these behaviors that people want to do, but for lack of good product design, don't do. So I would say uh, uh, a product that uh, I use quite a bit, <laughs> uh, that has become a habit, is uh, Pocket. Have you ever used Pocket? Pocket is an app that I think builds a great habit. Um, I have a rule that I never read articles on my desktop. Because I know the media designs their stories, especially the foreign media, much I think more so than the Singaporean media, but you know, CNN and Fox News and New York Times, uh, BBC, they design their products with clickbait. Right? Clickbait is designed to have that headline that gives you to say, well, well, tell me more. Right? That's how they design their stories. And I want to stay up to date with current events. I love reading essays, but I don't want to spend hours doing it. And I know if I start doing it on my desktop, I'm going to read and read and read and read. It's going to take me down this terrible rabbit hole. So instead, what I do is I send every article on my desktop to Pocket. I have a rule. I never read on my desktop. I, I click one button. The article is sent to Pocket. And now I have it on my phone. This little app. Now, what this app does, it, it scrapes out all the links, all the images, and all the sidebar of links to other articles. So I just see the text of the article I want to read. And I have a rule that I reward myself. This is called temptation bundling. Temptation bundling is when you take a reward from one area of your life, and you use it to get you to do something you don't really feel like doing in another area of your life. So whenever I'm in the gym, whenever I'm taking a walk, Whenever I'm doing something healthy, like you know, doing some kind of physical exercise, I listen to those articles read to me. You can take out your earbuds, you put it in, and it will read to you with like a Siri-like voice those articles. And I, I, I probably listen to 30 articles a day. So what, what did I do? Now this is a great example of using tech for good, right? How building a tech habit saves me time, not spending too much time, you know, scrolling and scrolling useless articles. And it incentivizes me to exercise because now I have this reward of listening to interesting content. So that's a product I probably you know spend over an hour a day using. Awesome. Uh, questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's obviously a thanks. Right. So there's obviously a lot of examples in the commercial space of like habit forming products, and it's almost essential nowadays to prove that in order to have a successful company. Um, but do you have any examples of how like habit forming has achieved sort of like large scale social and like positive social impact. You know, like has it has it like have there been cases where you managed to get like entire communities to like donate to charity more or like you know exercise more things like that. Um, and conversely, uh, what are some you know yeah, as someone who is you know sort of the expert in, in making habit forming things, uh, if you could make you know, what what are the opportunities for sort of like positive for, for habit forming that you think are the most untapped in terms of you know getting the world to be a better place to mm -hmm. speak in a very broad term. Yeah, good question. So in terms of uh, have products made a positive impact, I think overall, absolutely yes. We only hear, you know, I can point you to specific examples. For example, Kahoot was a, a company that does now public, uh, that uses the book model. A guy called me up five years ago. I do these office hours for 15 minutes every week where anybody who's read the book can call me. And this kid calls me up and says, hey, I, I read your book, and I want to build this product. Here's my book. And he takes out, and he shows me trigger, action, reward, investment, and we talk about it. 
I said, wow, that's pretty cool, it's pretty impressive, can I, can I invest a little bit of money? And just last year, they went public, they're at a $4 billion valuation, and they're touching the lives of hundreds of, hundreds of millions of children today, building this habit of, with online education. Uh, so that, you know, that, I think that's a terrific example. Fitbot is another terrific example. This, this product, this app, that gets people into this fitness habit. There's all kinds of products. Those are the, the specific examples you can't argue with, right? Like, uh, that, that's total goodness that people get into the habit of physical exercise or saving money or learning something new online. I would also argue that as much backlash as we've had recently with, with social media, by and large, I think social media has done a lot of good. Now, we have to remember what Paul Virilio said, which is when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. That every new technology on this massive scale is going to have some downsides. And that's what we're working through now, right? We didn't stop sailing ships, and yet how many times do you hear about a shipwreck? I mean, how many ships are here in the Singapore Harbor and you never hear about shipwrecks anymore? Why? Is it because we stopped sailing ships? No, we made ships better. And that's what we see right now happening. I mean, if you think about the good that, that I think social media has done connecting people, uh, allowing disparate groups who wouldn't otherwise have an outlet to connect, uh, allowing people to uh, learn new things. I mean, think about how, how much good YouTube has done. I mean, I know that we only look at the downside and we think these technologies have always been here, but I mean, it's a massive amount of good these companies have done. I mean, the things that my daughter can do that I never could do, because when she wants to learn how to do something, somebody online shows her how to do it. <laughs> so I think, by and large, like, the good done way, way, way outweighs the bad. Doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on the bad and make it better, but the way we make things better is not by saying ban it, regulate it, get rid of it, it's learn how to use it better and make the products themselves better. Um, and then in terms of untapped areas, I think what we're going to see in the next few years uh, is going to be a lot of opportunity created in the space of biometric information. That's still untapped, uh, I think, by and large. So there's all these products, like I'm wearing the Aura Ring right now, which is this device that you can't really see it from there, but it has these three sensors in there that track heart rate, heart rate variability, temperature. So uh, when I got my COVID booster, uh, this thing knew something was going on. It knew I had a fever <laughs> when I got it. So imagine a future where you know, a device you're wearing or um, uh, your bed or something, some kind of ubiquitous computing device tells you you should go get a COVID test because this pattern of, of uh, symptoms that you don't even realize are happening, uh, say you might be, you know, you should go take this, prevent, now that we have these preventative uh, drugs, you should go take this pill right away because it's only effective if you take it the first five days. Like how incredibly empowering could that be? So I think as technology becomes more ubiquitous, we're, we're gonna see an explosion of opportunities uh, for these products that not only give you lagging indicators, the state of the art today is only lagging indicators, which is why we see most of the technology that's supposed to get people fit, like fitness bands, step counters, people tend to put that in their drawer within 90 days. Why? Because it only gives you lagging indicators, right? What it does for most people is it says, hey, you still didn't walk your 10,000 steps. Right? Well, what do I do with that? It's too late. Now it's 9 p.m. at night. I, I, can't, I can't go outside and get my 10,000 steps right now. It's too late. Right? So those lagging indicators, they're not variable rewards. They're variable punishments. Right? I see this with um, financial services products all the time. When I work with banks and clients who are trying to get people to save money, their current state of the art is to tell people you're still broke and you're still fat. Well, I'm not going to use your product if that's, if that's the reward. It's not a variable reward. It's a variable punishment. The future will be a move away from lagging indicators towards leading indicators. If a product can tell you in advance, hey, do these things now to prevent some kind of outcome in the future, that's when it becomes truly habit forming. So a fitness, uh, for example, like, you know, a, 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 a fit, uh, what do they call those? Fitbit, right? A Fitbit that tells you, hey, you still didn't walk as many steps as you should have, that nags you, that's not fun. However, a product that says, hey, we see on your calendar that you have a flight coming up, and last time when you took the flight, you had pretty bad jet lag, you should start going to sleep 20 minutes earlier every night in order to bank sleep. Oh, okay, well that's, now that tells me something I have to do tomorrow to prevent something bad happening, I'm sorry, do today to prevent something bad happening tomorrow. That would be an example of a leading indicator we're gonna see. Okay, we'll move to online questions. Uh, there are a few. Uh, maybe I'll start with, what's your tech wish list for the Singapore government? Tech wish list. In terms of products, services, or infrastructure. If, that, if there's uh, one tech I wish we would change in Singapore, uh, it's e cigarettes. 
Singapore has done a fantastic job discouraging smoking. Fantastic job. I love the, the box of shame that we put people into when they smoke. Love it, right? Why? What we're doing is adding friction to an unhealthy behavior. We're not saying don't smoke. It's your prerogative to smoke. But we're going to make it more difficult for you. You can only smoke here. I, I wish we would do that in the States. It's genius. But what we are missing, I think, in Singapore, and I think where there's an opportunity for technology, is we need to have a harm minimization framework. And technology does that. Technology can give us harm minimization. It's almost like, you know, if you want to, I know we don't have a drug problem in Singapore, but for example, when you treat a heroin addict, you don't, it's very ineffective to tell, take someone who's addicted to heroin who wants to stop and say stop. Very ineffective. What you do is you go from heroin to methadone to substances that are decreasingly harmful. And that's what we need to do, I think, with smoking, right? To tell people stop smoking is an incredibly destructive behavior. We know it's very costly to the individual, of course, to the healthcare system. And Singapore has much higher smoking rates than we do in the States. I think what we need to do is to use technology to reduce the harm done. And we know that e-cigarettes, I mean, you know, there's a whole discussion about who starts smoking e-cigarettes, we can talk about that as well. But for someone who's currently addicted to tobacco smoke, e-cigarettes are far less harmful. So that's something I wish we would do. We need to keep the same restrictions of the box of shame and all the restrictions around smoking. But I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would make uh, e-cigarettes maybe even mandatory. Like, let's ban tobacco leaf. Let's say if you want to get your nicotine fix, uh, then this is a much, much less harmful way to do it. I think that that's the continue on, on that thread, right? I think the, the, the wonder of people, like what people wonder is, would that result in a new class of people who would never have smoked a uh, physical cigarette right now suddenly? So this is always the argument. So uh, when the birth control pill came out, it was the same discussion. Oh, if you let women take the birth control pill, they're going to be more lascivious and they're going to have unprotected sex and they're going to have, you know, it's going to backfire. And of course that doesn't happen. <laughs> that people, by and large, when you get what people want a safer alternative. And of course, you need to couple the, these kind of measures with campaigns that show, look, you know, this is for a specific type of person. This is for the kind of person who's trying to reduce harm, not the person who's going to start smoking. Because look, people are going to start smoking regardless. If they're going to start, and if, or if they want to quit, let's give them this option, I think, as, as a path out of this terrible dependence to the, the real the real harm of cigarettes is not the nicotine. You can ingest nicotine every single day, and it's not going to absorb your life at all. The real harm is tobacco smoke. That's what's dangerous: the tar, the the, the carcinogens that are in the smoke itself. So, by having that risk or the, the harm reduction attitude, uh, I think we can save lives. And by the way, I'm not I'm not a smoker at <laughs> all. No, it's not I'm not you know it's not personally uh, uh, selfishly motivated there. <laughs> Uh, how does the hook model apply to products meant for tea? So in particular, if the benefit hasn't accrued to the person using it, but to a larger group of people. Yeah, so um, for you mean for a product that's used by, by a team. So uh, there's pros and cons to building a product that's uh, used by a team. The pro is that once people start using a group product, there is a lot of lock-in. So if you think about Slack, for example, when you uh, invest in the product, that investment phase of connecting APIs, connecting their teammates, and everybody's using it, even if a better product comes along, you're not going to leave. Because you've invested so much in getting your whole team on board. So it becomes very sticky. The con is that there's additional friction to onboarding other people, and many times serving other stakeholders. So the hardest habit-forming products to build are the ones that require multiple stakeholders to form habits. It's much easier to build a habit with a product that just serves one person at a time. Okay, um, what are some common red flags you see in, in products that prevent them from being added for it? Number one is frequency. Number one, when, when I talk to products and they say, oh, we want people to do this and that and the other, I say, well, how often do you expect that to occur? If it doesn't occur within a week's time or less, almost impossible to form a habit. It doesn't mean it can't be a good business. Lots of products that are not habit forming can be a good business. So for example, uh, uh, car insurance. You don't use car insurance every day or every week, right? God forbid. You only use car insurance if something terrible happens, if you get in an accident. So you don't have to build a habit with a product like car insurance. Now, as a business, you have to have some kind of competitive advantage, right? Or else you're just fighting on price and features all day long and you, you can't make much money. 
So you have to have some kind of lock-in, whether that's intellectual property, whether that's uh, uh, a brand or a habit. But if you're trying to build a product that does require a habit, that have, that behavior has to occur with sufficient frequency, so at least time or less. And so from a team perspective, uh, sometimes the product is endemically not going to be habit forming. There's some solutions to that. You can actually bolt on a habit forming experience, like for example, content. If you can get people to the, into the habit of consuming interesting content, that is something that occur can occur certainly you know every day uh, or at least once a week. And then the result of that engagement will be monetization or some kind of other habit. Uh, community. If you can build a community habit where people are interacting with the product. Uh, interacting with that, that with other people, fulfilling that need of, uh, of of human connection, needing to understand others and be understood yourself, you can form a habit of that, so that the result of that engagement is eventually a monetization event. Uh, so number one is frequency. I think number two is not defining a behavior, a singular specific behavior. Many product teams that I work with, they have these aspirations, right? We want people to be financially secure. That's not a behavior, right? That's a wish. <laughs> we want people to live a healthy lifestyle. Again, that's not a behavior. That's an aspiration. So the behavior has to be very specific. Open an app, scroll a feed, click a video. Very specific behavior we want people to do. That's where we start. That's the atomic unit that we build the user experience around. Cool. Uh, in the course of talking to product teams, how much would you say the, the the hooks are actually intentional versus by by coincidence it ended up building a product with hooks? So it used to be, so that's a great question. It used to be that I had to convince people that these techniques were being used. I used to have to tell people, you know, uh, these folks in Silicon Valley, so I was in Silicon Valley from uh, starting in 2006, and so many of the people who helped build Google and Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, these were my friends. And uh, I told people, you know, the people in the industry, like, these, these folks know what makes you click and what makes you tick better than you understand yourself. It's no coincidence that the people who started Instagram were symbolic systems majors at Stanford. Symbolic systems is psychology and technology. Everybody knows that Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard and he was a computer science major. But do people know that he was also a co-major in psychology? Right? That psychology is at the basis of why we do what we do. So, of course, it's going to come into... Uh, practice when it comes to changing behaviors through the technology we use. So having some kind of understanding of, of you know, this is 50, 60 year old research. It's, this is not new stuff. This is not controversial. So understand that those consumer psychology principles is the difference between building the right thing and the wrong thing. Uh, and, and so that's that, that's actually critical. But there's one thing that you know to answer your earlier question around where do I see product teams making a mistake is that they're too slow to iterate. That there's a direct correlation between the speed of experimentation and the likelihood of success. That many times we think, oh, the product needs to be perfect, it needs to be fully baked, it needs to be polished, and then we'll release it. That's not how we build products in Silicon Valley. Right? There's a saying, if you're not embarrassed by your product, you release too late. You want to get that product out there, you want customer feedback, you want people to complain about it, because that means you're moving, right? You're trying, you're iterating, you're changing, you're experimenting. That's a very good principle. We, 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 Successful product teams that will always follow. You never get it right the first time. Also, we're going to put two live questions one here and then one in the back. How do you see that culture plays a role? Because I actually recently also have been to the Valley here to Singapore, so I don't know if resonates. Um, and, and you made a comment earlier about how many of the apps here are so crazy busy, and that's also one of my observations. I don't know where to look or where to start. But I'm also an angel investor, and many new startups that have the freedom to design something simple, right, still create these really busy apps. So yeah. I'm curious about culture. Yeah, so I think there is one group of people that says, well, this is just how we like it in Asia, right? And I actually think that that's not true. Mm -hmm. That the principles of, of consumer psychology apply across culture and race and gender, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That we see in studies, when you make a behavior easier to do, more people do it, period. <laughs> right? This is, the, this is the, the, the bedrock of usability, is the easier something is to do, the more likely people are to do it. So one of those six factors of ability is cognitive load, that the more I have to think about something, 
whether it's where do I push or do I trust this vendor or um, uh, what are you know what, what, what what's am I going to make a mistake? The more thinking I have to do, the less likely people are to take that action. I think the reason it exists is its legacy, frankly. That um, I think folks have in, in the tech industry in Asia tend to look at what someone else does and copy that without really understanding why things are designed the way they are. And the problem with designing products by doing what your competitor does is that you think they know more than you do, and they're just as cool as. So you just repeat their mistakes. And so when we think about how we went from desktop, right, big screens on our desks, to laptops, to mobile screens, and now wearable devices with even smaller screens, and now with Amazon Alexa and uh, uh, Siri, now there's no screen. What's happened is the amount of real estate that we have to send people external triggers has decreased. When, you, when we started in tech, you had a big screen, and you could put lots of buttons on it. You can't put those kind of buttons on this screen. It's just too small. But we kept that pattern because we copied what other people did. And we didn't test and iterate to see if it actually performed better. And in my experience, without fail, in my over decade of working with companies, when you simplify the experience, especially with mobile, you get a dramatic uptake in people doing the behavior you've designed for them to do. So the best antidote to changing culture is experimentation. It's not, we should do, we should do. It's, why don't we try? Let's run a test. Right? Usability studies. It's so easy today. It used to be very, very hard. Right? Today, it's, it's a joke. You can do usability testing. In, in you know, an hour, you can get 100 people to try a new interface. So test it and see. Don't take my word for it. See. And, and so that, that should guide us. You mentioned that there's a difference between um, making a good product and a bad product. So my question to that is, who gets to decide what's a good product and a bad product? Yeah, so I think that, that's a great question. I think what's a good product or a bad product is whose goals does it fulfill? And this is what I think is so beautiful about the work we do. That if you design a product, what you are doing is solving people's problems. That's our business. It's not designing apps. We are in the problem solving business, right? And, and more specifically, the emotion problem solving business. If there's no internal trigger, which is always a negative emotional state, there's no problem, right? We don't build, we don't bother people when they're happy and satisfied and doing great. We provide solutions to products when there is a need, when there's you know, insecurity, uh, fearfulness, uh, uh, stress, anxiety. That's when we have an opportunity to help people. So uh, I think a successful product is one that people continue to use. And so that's why this, this habit-forming technology is so important. That if we can't get people to, uh, to use our product in a way that benefits them, we're not stupid. After a while, people stop using it, right? TikTok is one of the most habit-forming products I've seen. But if it's not serving you, a lot of people do what I did. Delete. Because it wasn't giving me what I wanted. And so it's actually critical if you want to be in business for the long term. You've got to find a way to exchange value with the consumer in a way that they want to keep doing business with you. That, that response seems to be heavily based on the assumption that the person is rational or that human beings are rational and that we will constantly make this decision knowing that it's best for us. Um, my, I'm wondering if that's a safe enough assumption to make and from your experience, have you seen uh, a broad number of people be able to adapt and make those decisions for themselves? Yeah, so the good news is that the vast majority of people, believe it or not, are pretty rational. <laughs> that by and large, you know, we talk about how uh, behavioral economics and being, people being uh, predictably irrational, that tends to be the, uh, uh, the exception, not the rule. That by and large, you know what predicts what people will do? Incentives, right? Like, you guys know in Singapore more than anybody. Right? If you, if you uh, increase the price of the ERP, right? is that what's called the ERP? Guess what? Fewer people will drive because they're rational. Right? We, people by and large are pretty smart. Right? Like, and they, you can trick anybody once, but the second time, people figure it out and they say, oh, this, this is, I need to change my behavior because this is serving me or this is not serving me. So by and large, people do act very rationally with incentives. When the behavior, when doing the right thing is easy enough to do, when we see people doing things that we think are irrational, 
we oftentimes don't give enough credit to the fact they're not being irrational, they're just conserving energy. Another word for that is lazy. We are cognitive misers. We will do things, uh, or not do things, that we know we should or shouldn't do, simply for the fact that they are effortful. The number one reason we don't do what we say we're going to do is because we don't feel like it. I know I should exercise, but I don't feel like it. I know I should work on that big project, but I don't feel like it. I know I should call my mom, but I don't feel like it. <laughs> it's, it's those uncomfortable sensations. So what we have to do as product designers is to give people the ability to increase their ability to do a particular behavior uh, to cater to that uncomfortable emotional state, to make it easier for them to do that behavior. Because again, the easier something is, the more likely it, the, the people are to do it. So don't confuse uh, laziness or even more importantly, poor product design, right? It's our fault that people, you know, how many times I can't, if I had a penny for every time a product designer said, oh, people are so stupid, right? We've designed a product for them to use, they don't use it. No, they're not stupid, you're stupid. <laughs> right? We never blame the users. It's always our fault as a designer. If they don't do what we've designed for them to do, it's not their fault, it's our fault. We have to make the product easy enough to use so that they can do what they ultimately want to do. Because everybody wants to exercise, everybody wants to save money, everybody wants to you know, build a nest egg. We all want these things. It's that our environments don't make it easy enough for us to do these things. And so that's our job as designers. Thank you. Sure. Um, actually, this leads quite well, I think, to my final question, which is uh, one on design ethics. I'm curious as to, in, in your experience, in your process of designing uh, across all systems, whether design ethics is something that is carefully woven into the various stages and how, how, how has it been done? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah that, that's a terrific question. So in Hooked, I gave a, uh, a, a test uh, in, in the book. It's called The Morality of Manipulation. There's a chapter in the book titled Morality of Manipulation. And I give this matrix um, that you can use as a designer, just for you, to ask yourself, is, uh, is this a good use of my human capital, right? Personally, not for you to judge other people or for other people to judge you, but looking yourself in the mirror and asking yourself, is what I'm doing worth my precious human capital, my, my, my small time on Earth? So that's an individual basis. I think what you're asking about is in the design process. And so for that, uh, after I wrote Hooked, I was looking for what do we do, not just as individuals, but what do we do with organizations, right? If a company or an organization wants to use what we call a, design, a, a dark pattern, a dark pattern is, is trickery, is when we use you know, behavioral design to get people to do something they later regret. And so I was looking for what kind of ethical test could we use. So at Google, they use don't be evil, or at least they used to. It's no longer their mantra. That used to be their mantra, it no longer is. But that's not a very good test because evil is subjective. What's evil to you might be not evil to you. So that's not a very good metric. Then the lawyers, if you talk to lawyers, they'll tell you, well, just disclose, right? Just tell people what you're going to do and then you'll be fine. But then you get what we have now, which is these mile long terms of service agreements, which nobody reads. Uh, what, there was a case where a, a designer inserted into the terms of service, you will sell your eternal soul to Satan inside the user agreement just to see if anybody read it. And of course, nobody did, right? You can put anything into those terms of service. Or you get something even worse, which is GDPR. If anybody's been to Europe, I know we haven't traveled much, but if you go to Europe, you gotta click that stupid button that every single freaking website that nobody reads does nothing. It just has a button that people press not knowing a thing about what they're pressing. So disclosing is not necessarily a solution. It just makes it tends to make things worse, and it's not ethical either. The right, I think, ethical bar is, uh, is a variation on the golden rule. What's the golden rule? The golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But that's not good enough, because who says that we as the designer should be the ultimate arbiter of what others want, right? It's not good enough to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. The right metric should be do unto others as they want done to themselves. Do you want to others as they want done for themselves? But how do we do that? How can I get inside someone's head? This is the beauty of our industry. We test, right? How many industries can get into people's heads the way we can? How do we do that? So we run what's called a regret test. A regret test acknowledges that there's two kinds of manipulation, okay? There's ethical manipulation, which we call persuasion. Persuasion is helping people do things they want to do. Unethical. Uh, manipulation is called coercion. Coercion is getting people to do things they don't want to do. 
The difference between persuasion and coercion is one word, and that one word is regret. So the idea here is if we feel influenced on a design team to use a dark pattern, all we have to do is to raise our hand and say, you know what, boss? I'm a little worried people might regret doing business with us if we use this design pattern. Let's run a regret test. How do you run a regret test? The same way we do all usability testing. We build, bring in a sample size of people. You can even do this online now with a representative sample. And you show them the user flow. And you make sure they know everything the designer knows. And you ask, hey, if this happened, would you regret what you just did? We have to do this with 10 people. That's it. And then we have a bar. We say, you know, we used to have like server uptime. You remember back in the days when you had, you know, four nine server uptime? And oh, our company always has four nine server uptime. We should have an ethical bar to say, look, nine out of ten people don't regret doing business with us. Some kind of ethical bar. The good news is you almost never have to actually do this test. Because just the, the chilling effect of saying, hey boss, let's run a regret test on that. I just want to make sure that before we push this out to the public that we learn now if people regret doing this. Because look, if people regret doing business with you, not only will they not do business with you, they're going to tell all their friends on social media not to do business with you. So it behooves you. It's in your interest to run a regret test like this to make sure you're acting ethically. It's not only good ethically, it's good for business. And that just that, that question of, hey, we should run a regret test, filters out 99% of dark patterns. So I think that that's an ethical bar I, I, I think we should use in our industry. Mm -hmm. So how often do you consult the more traditional or bigger type of organizations and how do you help them to take more risk? Because yeah. yeah, because experimentation is also about that risk appetite that they have. So have you worked with say leaders or decision makers on that and, and what what works for them? Yeah. I think it's very hard to get people to try new things on a large scale because it's too it's very risky, right? Especially in GovTech. I think the answer to that is, is small sample sizes. Right? When you can go and test, you don't even have to test the entire user experience. You can just test small modules. Uh, there's so many sites these days that you can use, so many technologies uh, that you can you can test a particular user experience just to see will people know where to click. Right? You can give people say look you know put yourself in the shoes of someone who wants to do an XYZ task, how likely are you to do it with this treatment versus giving another group a different treatment? This is the kind of stuff you can do with very little risk, right? It's people who know they are there to run an experiment, right? It's, and it's not a live product. Uh, and you don't need to do it with thousands and thousands of people, and you don't need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. It's, it's pretty inexpensive. So I think the way you, you influence decision makers is to say, this is you know, a few hundred people, maybe tens of people. Uh, a few thousand dollars, this isn't going to be a, 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 a large scale thing. And we're going to see before we move this to production, before we send it out to everyone, let's see if we can make an incremental change in this behavior we're trying to influence. So small sample size, small tests, enabled by technology that we didn't have a few years ago. Right. Great, thank you, thank you. And uh, just one more question, let's see. Um, one more question would be then, uh, with, with your experience working with different organizations, how do you encourage more people to cultivate that user empathy versus prioritizing, let's say, business needs or other kind of political agenda? Mm. Well, I think a, a company that's not user first doesn't stay around very long, at least in the public sector. Uh, that your competition will eat your lunch if they're if they are more consumer facing. They're going to build a better product if they focus first and foremost on the consumer. Uh, in the in the public sector, that's a good question. May have, for many services, government has a monopoly, right? You, you don't have a lot of competition, and so that's maybe that, that's why it could certainly be more difficult to uh, to light a fire under people to move quicker to experiment because what's going to happen if we don't? What's the incentive model? Uh, so that's 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 I think that's tricky in certain sectors, but if, for sure in the public sector, it's well we got to do it or somebody else will. Right. And is in the private sector, right? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I've got a question that's more to do with indestructible rather than cost. Sure. Which is, um, I mean, in the past two years, right, almost two years, I think that the way people get distracted. Everything has really amplified with lockdowns and social isolation and all that stuff. 
And we kind of see, it's interesting how, you know, the, uh, there's a spectrum of responses to that, right? Like on the one hand, you have people who, um, with all of this sudden new time, uh, they pick up really good habits, like they exercise more, etc. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who both like save a lot of money and also go on like increased spending sprees, right? Um, what do you think these external factors, like how do they influence how people respond to them and what do you think provokes like this vast difference in how people respond to it, especially that you saw of actually Yeah, no, it's, it's a very astute observation. So I wrote Indistractable before COVID and I'm so glad I did because I don't know if I would have made it through without, without the techniques I learned because what happened during COVID is that those internal triggers, remember those uncomfortable emotional states, went way up. Right, the uncertainty of what's going on with this virus, and uh, will, will I still have a job? And uh, what, what's good the world going to be? Look, what's the world going to look like in the stock market? The political situation. There was so many, almost so much uncertainty, uh, which is what we saw that people. You know, this was a great time to be in the media business because people were turning for answers to watching the news and uh, scrolling Facebook and, and looking for answers, uh, whether they got them or not. <laughs> and so. You definitely saw that the rise of internal triggers, the more uh, palpable these internal triggers became, the more likely people were to turn to distraction, whether it was uh, you know, checking our phones more, whether it was drinking more, whether, whether it was whatever behavior to take our mind off of these uncomfortable emotional states. The second thing that changed is that working from home, the external triggers changed. So when we did surveys before COVID, the number one source of distraction in the workplace wasn't technology, it was other people. It was your boss tapping on the shoulder and saying, hey, where's that TPS report? Or a colleague saying, hey, did you hear about that bit of office gossip? That was the number one source of distraction. But now, working from home, it's not your boss, it's not your colleagues, it's your kids, it's your spouse, it's your roommate, it's a hundred other things that are different. So I don't know if it's made things better or worse. I think for some people, it's better. For some people, it's worse. Um, it, I really think it, it depends on the kind of job you're in. What I think it, it did do is that it, it kind of reshuffled the deck a bit uh, around our habits and made us reconsider whether our routines were so necessary, right? Was it really necessary to be in the office this much? Was it really necessary to commute and spend so much time in traffic? Was, was all that really necessary uh, and to what degree? Because I think we, we did all become kind of habituated with thinking, well, this is the way things always are. They're never going to change. And so it took this, this massive change forced upon us to kind of reconsider our behaviors, to reconsider our habits. And so I think it's it's kind of a lesson for all of us to ask ourselves, wait a minute, if we can be shaken so violently in our past behaviors and our past routines, what else about our life can we shake up? Right? What else about our life is nothing more than habit. It's just we're doing it because we've always done it this way. And we can see that we are extremely malleable, that if we want to change, we can adopt new routines, which is the basis of, of indistractable. So indistractable is all about how to do whatever it is you say you want to do with what you want to do with your time. So if you know it's not up to me or anyone else to preach to you what you should do with your time. If you want to exercise more, read more books, uh, uh, pray more, meditate, paint, whatever it is you want to do with your time, that's what I want to help you do with your time by being intentional. So it's not that tech is evil, that tech is causing these distractions at all. Distraction has always been with us. Plato, the great philosopher, talked about distraction 2,500 years ago before the internet. So it's not the technology that's causing these distractions. It's the fact that we haven't learned the skill set that we need to be indistractable, to decide in advance how we want to spend our time and attention. Uh, um, so we talked a lot about like sort of the, the, like, 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 yes, the artificial creation of habits and like, sort of, you know, the deliberate manipulation of habits, which is the whole point of the book. Um, I, I have a question more about like the natural formation of good and bad habits. Like, I guess, put it simply, why is it, you know, again, for like hundreds of years, some people are the kind who you know, wake up every morning, and exercise every day, and like will meditate, and will like call their mother, and do all that good stuff. And other people will get, uh, will have habits, like, you know, they'll drink, they'll eat too much, they will, you know, uh, you know play with things, uh, and get right. Like, I mean, look, this is all like a big indicator. Like, like, is it just that like, some people are smarter and then they form up? So, is it an intelligence thing? Or is it like, or if, if you look at sort of like the history of someone's childhood, why do some people just, without you know, reading a book or any form, naturally form a lot of good habits, some people naturally form a lot of bad habits? Yeah, so I think there's three factors. It's uh, the person, the product, and the pain. I mean, let me talk about those three things. So for sure, there are 
uh, some biological factors in the person, I think that we give them way too much credit. We think that people become addicted because of their genes. We think people are a certain way because of their genes. There is an effect, for sure. I think it's much less than we expect. There's also our upbringing, right? What, how do we learn uh, to, to deal with temptation in our lives by what we saw our parents doing? Uh, so that's, that's the person. Then there's the product, right? If you, let's say you have a propensity towards alcohol, but you grow up in a, an observant Muslim family and you don't drink alcohol, well, you're not going to become an alcoholic because you don't have exposure to that product. Uh, so, so the product clearly plays a role. And then there's the pain, and I think this is the part we don't talk about enough, that in certain situations, when we experience an amount of pain that we don't know how to cope with, this can lead us oftentimes to bad habits or addictions, if we have that propensity. And we, we know this from, some, from several studies. Uh, one of the most famous uh, was a study done on soldiers, American soldiers who came back from Vietnam during the Vietnam War. There was a very high rate uh, of, of soldiers who were uh, using heroin in, in, during the Vietnam War. And Nixon actually established the Drug Enforcement Agency because he was so scared of you know, this, this heroin epidemic happening when the soldiers came home. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. That soldiers who were addicted to heroin in Vietnam, when they came back to America, lost their addiction, which didn't make sense because if it's all about the, the product getting you addicted, well then why would they have suddenly lost it? Well, because the pain changed. The situation that they were in wasn't the hellscape that was the Vietnam War, it was home with their family and their jobs and their kids and things to live for. And so when we have to acknowledge that when we are in certain situations, we are more likely to succumb to bad habits and bad addictions. Uh, and so we need to be more, I think, more compassionate with folks that are having a tough time, whether it's uh, personal issues, whether it's financial hardships, whether it's health issues. These things make us more likely, and we've all, we all felt it over the past year, when we were more stressed, we're more likely to snack, we're more likely to drink, we're more likely to watch too much TV, right? Because we're looking to compensate, we're looking to escape something. So it's never one thing, right? No one ever stepped on a heroin needle and became addicted, right? Uh, no one ever became addicted to cigarettes on their first puff. That's not how addiction works. Addiction is, is, a much, is, is, is a confluence of these three factors of the person, the product, and the pain. Uh, and so the, the thing that we can arm ourselves with is more, you know, the, the, of those three, it's arming ourselves, understanding for ourselves how to deal with discomfort in a healthy way. If all human behavior is about a desire to escape discomfort, if we understand that discomfort, if we master those internal triggers, we can make sure they don't become our masters. I guess like making this a bit more practical, like as a parent, what are the things that you do that you know, that, that you are trying to maximize the chance that your daughter forms good habits and yeah. minimize the chance that she forms bad habits. Okay, so there's a whole chapter. The question, because uh, I know you weren't Mike, the question was about what, what we do with our kids. It's a terrific question. There's actually a whole chapter in my book about how to raise indistractable kids. I'm the father of a 13 year old girl. And uh, it's super important because if you think the world is distracting now, <laughs> just wait a few years. The, the world that our kids are going to inherit is going to be only more distracting as technology becomes more persuasive and more per, uh, pers, per, uh, sorry persuasive and um, sorry I lost my train of thought as, as technology becomes more ubiquitous the world is only going to become a more distracting place so it's absolutely essential that we teach our kids how to become more uh, how to become indistractable this is the skill of the century so it starts by understanding what their internal triggers are and I think this is something that as parents we gloss over okay so do we do we have time for me to answer this? okay this is because I think this is incredibly important. So starting from what, what, what are kids doing when they overuse technology? And I'm not talking about normal use. If you look at every study about technology use, three hours or less of extracurricular screen time, not one study has found has any negative effects. Okay? So let's start there. If your kid, you know, I talk to many parents, they say, oh, my kid's addicted to games, Roblox, uh, Minecraft. I'm addicted to it. I say, well, can they have dinner at the dinner table? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, every night. How are their grades? Uh, yeah, A's and B's. Okay, well, your kid's not addicted. <laughs> okay, let's start with that. It's not a compulsive dependency. But what about the kids who do overuse, right? More than the three hours a day. How do we prevent them from, from overusing? It starts by understanding why they are overusing. Look, three hours of pretty much anything tells you there's something else going on. My daughter for many years was really into Harry Potter. And when she read more than three hours a day, I, you know, I would be concerned if she did that. 
right? So it's not just the technology. We have to ask what's behind this kind of behavior. So it starts from understanding what's called self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is the most widely accepted theory of human motivation, that every human being on the face of the earth needs three things. We need uh, autonomy, relatedness, and connectedness. Right? We need these three things, autonomy, connectedness, and relatedness. And so what we have to do is understand that our kids today are starved for these three psychological nutrients. When we think about autonomy, our kids today have less time they, uh, to do what they want to do than ever before. It's the most regulated generation in history. The average child today has twice as many, sorry, 10 times as many regulations as an adult, twice as many regulations placed on them as a person in the military service. So we regulate our kids all the time. We tell them where to go, what to do, where to think, uh, how to dress, what to eat. There's only two places you can do that to people, and that's school and prison. So it's no surprise that when we put people in cages, guess what? They behave like animals. And our kids are so desperate for autonomy, they're so desperate to have some kind of freedom, that guess what they do? They go to virtual worlds where they can be gods. They can be in control. It feels good. We want that autonomy. So they go online. When we think about mastery, okay, this need for mastery and control, there's a good segment of the population, again, I'm not as familiar with Singapore as I am with the States, there's a good segment of the population that is, is uh, because we instituted in the States this constant testing regimen, now, you know, today, uh, I, again, I'm not as familiar with Singapore, we test kids constantly, because we pay our teachers now in the States based on these tests. Uh, we, we test them repeatedly starting in the first grade. It's gone way overboard. And so there's a subset of the population of children who don't feel mastery, who don't feel like they're good at anything. And so what do you do if you don't feel like you're good at anything? You don't have that sense of mastery. You go online. On the game, you feel like you're a master. You feel like you control that environment. And then finally, relatedness. We know that, that free play, the time to just be with your friends and be a kid, has declined in the industrialized world like it never has. This is the, the children today have less time to play than ever before with other, with other kids. And that time for free play is absolutely essential for our psychological well-being. And this is time not with teachers, not with coaches, not with parents, time to be with other kids, because that's where we learn our place in the world. It's one thing if your parents says, don't do that. It's a whole other thing if one of your friends says, hey, you're being a jerk, stop doing that. Right? That's where we learn our place in the world. But kids don't have time for free play because they've got all these tuition, they've got the mandarin, they've got the swim lessons, they've got the ballet, they have no time to play. So what do you do if you have no time for relatedness? Ah, go on Facebook, go on WhatsApp, that's where my social engagement is. Play Fortnite with a the kid. They're not playing a video game, they're hanging out with their friends. That's what they're doing, that's what we used to do on the phone in our generation. So by understanding these psychological nutrients, understanding the vitamins that our kids are deficient in, we can begin to understand why they are overusing. And that's where we start. And then we use the other techniques in the book. There's, there's three other pillars of how to help build and from kids. But I think it starts with understanding those internal triggers. If we gloss over that, we don't get to the root cause of the problem. We blame this, and parents have doing this, been doing this forever. My parents said, oh, it's too much TV. Their parents said it's too much radio. Their parents said it's the comic books. Every generation does this. They blame what's in our hands as opposed to what's in our heads. One of the strategies that you that you advocate for in your book is time boxing, right? Because that way, if you box your time and you say, I need, I need to be doing this, then at least you know if you're, if you're doing it or not. In an environment which values really quick responses, uh, right? Which most of them is they expect people to respond really, really quickly. How do you do this effectively or how does that work? Yeah, so uh, the principle of time boxing says that you can't say you got distracted from something unless you know what it distracted you from. Let me say that again. You can't say you got distracted from something unless you know what you got distracted from. So if you have lots of white space on your calendar, you can't say you got distracted. Because what did you get distracted from? You didn't plan what you wanted to do. So in order to make sure that we are indistractable, we have to plan our time. We have to say in advance how we want to spend our time. By the way, thousands of studies have confirmed this, peer-reviewed studies that showed the most effective way to manage your time is to decide in advance what you want to do with it. If you keep a to-do list and you run your life based on to-dos, you've made a huge mistake. <laughs> and I used to do this all the time. To-do lists suck. <laughs> they actually actively hurt your productivity. Now, I'm not saying writing things down on a list. That, that's good. What's bad is running your life on that. If all you do is write down the to-dos and don't put them on your calendar, if you haven't time boxed it, that's a big problem. Now, the complaint is, okay, well, I've time boxed my day, 
but then when do I make time to be available for people, right? So that too can be time boxed. So there are two kinds of work. We have reactive work and we have reflective work. Reactive work is responding to people, responding to emails, reacting to messages, reacting to meetings. That is reactive work and that's how most people spend most of their day. That's how low performers spend their day. Low performers constantly react to things, reacting to phone calls, reacting to messages, reacting to notifications. And they make no time for what we call reflective work. Reflective work is the kind of work that can only be done without distraction. Strategizing, planning, thinking requires us to work without distraction. So the answer is we make time in our day, maybe even most of our day, is spent doing reactive work. If you have, uh, you know, if, if your job is you're managing a team and you need to be on call and available, great, okay, fine. You've got a big chunk of your day where that's what you do, that's what you plan to do, be available for your team. But if you don't make at least some time in your day, some time in your day, everyone's day, to have reflective work, to think for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, you're gonna run real fast in the wrong direction. So that's the answer, is to protect at least some time in your day and keep it sacred. Don't let anybody abuse that time. It's yours for reflective work. In eight minutes, but uh, first I have one question then I can open it up for the last questions. Sure. Which is, a lot of the principles that you cite are really great for individuals. A lot of us work in teams. How do we kind of you know, have that make, make use of these things in groups of people? Absolutely. So there's another section of the book about how to build an indistractable workplace. Uh, but the, the, the quick overview is that there's three characteristics of an indistractable workplace. Number one, they give people psychological safety. Psychological safety is has been widely studied. It's the ability to talk about a problem without fear of retribution. So if you can't raise your hand and say, you know, I am not able to do my best work because I'm constantly getting notifications every 30 seconds. If you can't talk about the problem, that is the problem. It's not the technology, it's the fact that you're scared because you don't have psychological safety to talk about this issue without thinking you're going to get fired. Okay, so that's number one. Companies that, that are indistractable, and I profile several in the book, give employees psychological safety. Number two, they give people a forum to talk about this problem. So some companies, one company, BCG, that I profiled in the book, has a, a weekly meeting to talk about this exact issue of giving people what they call predictable time off time to go to their kids' you know, game, or work out in the gym, or have dinner with their spouse. They have these weekly meetings. Another company I profile, Slack, you know Slack? They actually use Slack channels to talk about this problem of distraction. They have a Slack channel called Beef Tweets, where people literally post beef, like issues they don't like about the company, and company management uses emoji to signify that those messages have been read. So they'll use the eye emoji, they'll use the check mark emoji to say, hey, okay, we hear you. So number one, psychological safety. Number two is giving people a forum to talk about these problems. Number three, and most important attribute of an indistractable workplace, is that management exemplifies what it means to be indistractable. I can't tell you how many times I've been called in to do a workshop and teach a company how to be indistractable, and the boss calls me in, and I come to do the presentation, and in the back of the room, you know who's using their phone? If not the young people who are so-called tech addicted, it's the old folks. Right? They're the ones in the back of the room who are checking email because they're so important. They're the big boss. I need to check my email all the time. And what they're doing, culture is like water. Culture flows downhill. You look to your boss, and if your boss is constantly emailing, who do you think they're emailing? You think they're emailing you. So it's like a smoker, like secondhand smoke. When you, when you smell smoke, you want to smoke. Everybody now is on their email, and we have pretty soon what we call a zombie meeting. You know what a zombie meeting is? A zombie meeting is when you have a bunch of warm bodies in the room, but the brains are gone. The brains are somewhere else because everybody's on the phone. So why are we having a meeting if no, no brains are actually in the room? So we have to make sure that companies exemplify, that company management exemplifies what it means to be indistractable. So it's interesting, at Slack, which is this, this product that people complain, that it's the number two most distracting technology. The most distracting technology, see if you can guess, it's email. Number one most distracting technology according to surveys is email. Number two is Slack or some other group messaging service, right? WhatsApp or Slack or Basecamp. So I actually went to Slack and I, I expected, hey, if Slack makes this product that people complain is so distracting, they should be the most distracting people on earth, right? Because they're, they make the technology that people say is so distracting. But they weren't distracted at all. And in fact, if you use Slack on nights and weekends, 
you're told we don't do that here. You're chastised. That's not our company culture. We don't do that because everyone in the company, from the CEO on down, believes that in order to do your best work, you need time to disconnect. You need time to be indistractable. So in the company canteen, they have written on the walls, kind of something like this. They have like a place where we'll get together for lunches and stuff. They have a big sign in pink neon letters that says, work hard and go home. It's part of the company culture. So those are the three criteria, is psychological safety, a place to talk about these problems, and management needs to exemplify what it means to be indistractable. Now, those are things that require you know, corporate buy-in, that if you're a manager, there's no excuse, you can do this. But even if you're not, there's things that we can do as individuals to manage our manager. For example, one of the techniques I talk about in the book is called schedule syncing. So when you keep a time box calendar, you have this artifact, you have something you can hold on to and show other people. So what I recommend folks do is to sit down with their manager, with their boss, for 10 minutes a week. That's all it takes, 10 minutes. Hey boss, can I have your attention for just 10 minutes? I want to show you something. And show them your time box calendar for your working hours. And what you're going to do is you're going to show them, hey, here's how I plan my week. Okay, you see, you, uh, you want me to be at this meeting, this project, this, you know, here's what I'm going to do, email, here's my week ahead. Now you see this list, here's this piece of paper here. Here's all the stuff that you put on my plate that I'm having trouble finding time for. I'm having trouble prioritizing. Can you help me prioritize? And what this does, it saves you from some of the worst productivity advice I've ever heard, which you've all heard, which is if you want to be more productive, you have to learn how to say no, right? What kind of stupid advice? You're gonna tell your boss, no thanks, I don't wanna do that project. You, you can't do that, you're gonna fire. You can't do that to your boss. So instead of saying no, what you do is you say, help me prioritize. What's more important? And then what you're going to find if you sit down for these 10 minutes with your boss, which, which by the way, is going to worship the ground you walk on because every manager, they're wondering, what are my employees doing all day, right? What's my team doing? They don't want to ask you because they don't want to micromanage you. So if you proactively manage your manager by showing them, here's how I'm going to spend my time, what you're going to find is they're going to say, oh, you know what? That meeting that's actually not as important as that thing on the list here, let's swap those out. Right? So that practice is, is how we manage our managers, and we help them. We, they help we help them help us become indistractable. Awesome. Does anyone have a final final question for me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's What's the next book? Uh, what's the next book? Yeah, uh, I was hoping you would tell me. I don't know yet. <laughs> so typically, it takes me about five years to, to write a book. That's been my record so far. Uh, so I'm, I'm still I'm still working on it. I'm not sure quite yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> cool. Thanks everyone for, for joining us today. If you want to stay in chat with with Mary, has a little bit of time. Uh, I want to give you this token of appreciation uh, oh, from so us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>